This morning's message comes from 1 Kings chapter 14, verses 21 through 31. 1 Kings 14, 21 through 31. Now Rehoboam, the son of Solomon, reigned in Judah. Rehoboam was 41 years old when he began to reign, and he reigned 17 years in Jerusalem, the city that the Lord had chosen out of all the tribes of Israel to put his name there. His mother's name was Namah the Ammonite, and Judah did what was evil in the sight of the Lord, and they provoked him to jealousy with their sins that they committed, more than all that their fathers had done. For they also built for themselves high places and pillars and asherim on every high hill and under every green tree, and there were also male cult prostitutes in the land. They did according to all the abominations of the nations that the Lord drove out before the people of Israel. In the fifth year of King Rehoboam, Shishak, king of Egypt, came up against Jerusalem. He took away the treasures of the house of the Lord and the treasures of the king's house. He took away everything. He also took away all the shields of gold that Solomon had made and King Rehoboam made in their place shields of bronze and committed them to the hands of the officers of the guard who kept the door of the king's house. And as often as the king went into the house of the Lord, the guard carried them and brought them back to the guard room. Now the rest of the acts of Rehoboam and all that he did, are they not written in the book of the Chronicles of the Kings of Judah? And there was war between Rehoboam and Jeroboam continually, and Rehoboam slept with his fathers and was buried with his fathers in the city of David. His mother's name was Namah the Ammonite, and Abijam his son reigned in his place. This is God's word. Thank you for coming out. It's a blessing to have you here. Thanks to the worship team for leading us to the throne of grace. Um, today, at f right now, Pastor Joe is in Cross Lake. He's preaching up there, filling in, and we thank God for that ministry, a ministry of outreach, uh, helping other churches in times of need. And uh, we are going to pray for him. <clears throat> and uh, we also want to remember um, our brother Jerry and the loss of Shar. We continue to pray for him throughout the week. And all those who have suffered loss, we ask God's comfort upon you. Many thanks to Pastor Joel for leading us well during our time of prayer. The <clears throat> today at uh, during Sunday school class, uh, uh, Dr. Rosario Butterfield, by way of uh, online presentation, will give her testimony. And that will be in the uh, chapel. <clears throat> this is a woman who was once trapped by the sin of homosexuality, who came out. Uh, God delivered her, and a wonderful account. Just uh, you can hear in her voice the power of Christ. So that'll be in the chapel uh, right afterwards, uh, Dr. Rosario Butterfield. The, the other thing is um, at 4.30 today, there'll be no evening service at 6.30 p.m. Instead, we'll have 4.30. That's the Young Pastors Association now called Common Slaves for Christ. The Young Pastors Association is dedicated to encouraging each other in the name of Jesus and also uh, is dedicated to word and prayer, praying for reformation and revival in this world of great sin. These young pastors are, and elders are an encouragement to me, and we have many in this congregation. Pastor Phil is one of them, and he'll be closing today in prayer. And even if I don't remember, you will do it anyway, right, Phil? <laughs> so <clears throat> today at 4.30, uh, pastor, the pastor from Crosby, Eric Anderson, will be preaching. We're preaching through the texts of Titus, so if you're hanging around and you want uh, to hear the Word of God this afternoon, that's 4.30. 
singing and preaching and delighting in Christ. So we're going to look again at 1 Kings, 1 Kings 14, 21 through 31, just to set us up on this passage. You just take a look at it. Here is uh, a picture of Rehoboam, the son of Solomon, the son of David. And you're going to ask yourself, what happened? What happened to the kingdom here? Um, David, he is a, a man of repentance. He repented after the incident with Bathsheba. And God used him writing Psalms and um, uh, delighting in the person of God. That was David, and um, his son Solomon took over, was doing very well, and then the bridge collapsed. And um, fortunately, by the grace of God, by his mercy, uh, Solomon uh, restored near the end of his life and wrote Ecclesiastes. Now you have Rehoboam coming along, and Rehoboam um, loses the kingdom back in chapter 2. 12, uh, Rehoboam gets two tribes, Judah and Benjamin, and Jeroboam, the rebel, gets 10. Re Jeroboam is the king in, in uh, Israel, and Rehoboam is the king in Judah, where Jerusalem is. And so, here's the scene. <clears throat> Rehoboam now goes the way of his father in terms of idolatry. You want to note that back in chapter 12, Rehoboam rejected the, advi the advice of his elders, and now he's full-blown involved in idolatry. The question today is this, what happens when the people of God embrace idols? And uh, when I say people of God, I mean visible people of God. That is to say, Israel in the Old Testament, you had believers and non-believers together. The church in the modern era has believers and non-believers together. That's what is meant by the visible Israel and the visible church. What you see is a gathered church. What God sees are his people among them. So that's what the term visible church, visible people of God means. So when I say people of God today, think visible. Um, believers, non-believers involved in this This. Uh, tag, whether it's Israel or the church. The other thing to keep in mind is that idolatry, idolatry is a deadly thing. Now, modern America isn't Israel, and Israel certainly isn't modern America, but one thing we have in common is America and Israel are both nations. And when a nation <coughs> departs and embraces idolatry, look out. What we have right now is a nation <clears throat> full of idols, and we will touch on some of those as we go through the text. So the question before us is, what happens when the people of God embrace idolatry? What happens when the people of God embrace other things as if they are more important than God? An idol is something that we, we delight in or want more than God. And we know it's an idol because if it gets taken away from us, we get really ticked. What? Why would God take it away? Well, we are to love people and embrace the things that God has given us, but never replace God with them. Anything that replaces God at the center of our life is an idol, and that's something we face today. So let's pray, and then we'll deal with this question, what happens when the people of God embrace idolatry? Heavenly Father, in the name of Jesus, I certainly can't uh, present this, this sermon uh, without your help. I believe in the power of the Holy Spirit, and I pray, Lord, that you would help me today to say something, to say truth, and where it's bent, that you'd straighten it out and uh, help me, Lord, in this matter. Help us all to hear your voice um, in this matter and that you would guide our souls in the right direction. We pray these things in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. 
So what happens when the people of God embrace idolatry? A couple things happen. God is provoked, that's the first thing, and people lose blessing. That's the second thing. So that's where we're going. God is provoked and people lose blessing. Let's look at verses 21 through 24. Walk with me through the text. Now Rehoboam, son of Solomon, reigned in Judah. Now he's a king, so he has a palace. Everything is... is Apparently going well. Remember, Solomon had filled up the treasury. There were gold shields, um, buckets of gold. I mean, just buckets everywhere, sort of, sort of like around your houses, maybe. Just gold everywhere, shimmering uh, silver. Um, so it was a pretty wealthy place. And so here's Rehoboam. <coughs> and he was 41 years old when he began to reign. And he reigned 17 years in Jerusalem. The city, now note what God says, the city that the Lord had chosen out of all the tribes of Israel. The city that the Lord had chosen out of all the tribes of Israel. To put his name there. So God blessed Rehoboam in that Rehoboam was the king of of Judah and he sat on David's throne and he had all that he needed there and uh, <clears throat> not only that but he was in the very city where God chose to put his name in the temple see that look at all the blessings look at them all here that Rehoboam has and then there's this little note his mother's name was Nama the Ammonite I don't know if anyone names their child Nama anymore, but it might be a name to think of if you know someone who might be giving birth soon. Nama the Ammonite. And then all of a sudden, notice this, and Judah did what was evil in the sight of the Lord. Oh, you would think, after all that, after all that blessing, one would think, the line would read, and Rehoboam was so blessed by God that he did what was right in the sight of God. Uh-uh. It says, and Judah, with Rehoboam as its leader, he's not excluded, did what was evil in the sight of the Lord. What does the word evil mean? It means to go against the law of God, purposefully to sin, to go against the law of God, and they, Rehoboam, and the people, and they, what? And they committed, and they, and, uh, they provoked him to jealousy with their sins that they committed more than all that their fathers had done. What? <laughs> These people... They were champions at sin. We're going to read some of it soon. And they provoked him to jealousy. What? Well, I, you may be thinking, well, jealousy is a bad thing, isn't it? Well, no, only God can be jealous and not sin. Um, the great sin here is idolatry and worse than it could possibly be. And when it says that God is jealous, it speaks of his righteous demand for our total affection. He wants us to put our affection on him, which he deserves, and by this we are blessed. So that's what jealousy means. For they also built for themselves. Now here is where it gets wild. For they also built for themselves high places. What is a high place? It's altars to pagan gods. Think of this. The people of Israel going off, finding a hill somewhere in a high place and building an altar to a pagan god. Many of these pagan gods were just, all of them were utterly horrible. Now listen to this. Then, the Bible says, for they also built for themselves high places and pillars. And pillars, what is a what is a pillar? Well, it's a sacred stone. If you look at Deuteronomy 16.22, maybe sometime throughout the week, look up Deuteronomy 16.22. Sacred stones or pillars. 
And then there was Asherim. And Asherim on every high hill and under every green tree. So this stuff is all over the place. Asherim, wooden forms of a female deity. That's an Asherim, wooden form of a female deity. I have seen these at, in museum settings, and they too can be rather frightening. And notice this. And there were also male cult prostitutes in the land. Male cult prostitutes. This is, uh, these are words that indicate sexual wickedness. At its worst, what would happen in Canaanite religion is this. Worshippers would come to this false, this place of false worship, this place where idols were worshipped, and they would engage in sexual activity with um, uh, prostitutes. And here you have the male were highlighted. They were also female, but these guys were there, and people would come and and have relations with these people, and so get close to the deity. So that's what this is all about. This is wickedness, and you'll notice that a culture whether it be Judah or Israel or <coughs> whatever uh, one would consider, whatever nation, whenever a nation embraces idolatry, whenever it embraces its idols, weird sexual stuff starts happening and it starts being perverted on a great level. And that's certainly happening in this nation. Uh, people poncing about declaring themselves women when they're actually men. They know that themselves and vice versa. This is magical thinking. It's insanity. But it happens when cultures embrace idolatry. This is what happens. Weird sexual stuff starts coming out, redefining marriage and so on. Notice what it says. They did according to all the abominations of the nations that the Lord drove out before the people of Israel. Why did the Lord drive them out? Because they're abominable. What is an abomination? It is something that God hates. Idols ultimately bring disaster. Worshippers of evil will be, will provoke God. Idolatrous people, whether they're the people of God, when the people of God become idolatrous, they provoke God. He becomes jealous. He wants all our affection to himself. And when that doesn't happen, he is provoked. Now, he's also merciful. God must be justice but he tempers his justice with mercy. Doesn't have to be, but he is. He is merciful, he's loving, and he's forbearing. The point I want to get across here is when the people of God embrace idolatry, the people of God defined in Judah, when they embraced idolatry, they provoked God. And let me tell you, any nation on earth any nation on earth that provokes God through idolatry is in grave trouble. Never think that elections can stop the provocation of God. Now, how shall we apply this? If the people of God turn away from God and treasure such things as... Now, let's think of the modern era. The church, visible... The modern people of God, if we turn away from God and treasure such things as our reputations, our pleasure, our money, our pride, our sexuality in this culture, personal pre uh, pre preference and private pleasure without any significance before God, that's, that's up to us, we declare as a culture. Our sexuality is up to us. Well, no, it's not. Um, and so on, and so on, and so on. If the people of God turn away from God and treasure other things like these, then we will provoke the jealousy of God. Oh my. 
I have to pause and think about that because I want to ask the Lord, hunt through my heart. Show me the things that I value more than you, and may I dispense with them. O oh God, help me to battle the idols in my own heart. So what happens when the people of God embrace idolatry? God is provoked. The second thing is, the people lose blessing. The people lose blessing. Look at verse 25. This is the second point. In the fifth year of King Rehoboam, and here's the pharaoh, <coughs> Shishak, the king of Egypt, came up against Jerusalem. Now, um, Egypt was a mighty force, but not the most on earth at this time. So here they come, they come up against Jerusalem. Now, where is the army? This is the first question. Well, it's sort of got, it's just got swept aside here. So he took away the, and the, here comes the Pharaoh, and he takes away all the treasures of the house of the Lord. This is what Solomon built, remember? And he put all his treasure in there, and uh, God had blessed him this way. And um, so the Egyptian king just gets his army together, and they wander over to um, uh, Jerusalem, and they take all the gold. <laughs> Easy, wasn't it? Where's the army? Where is it? Well, that got pushed aside. There was nothing there to hold them back. And the treasures of the king's house, even the king's house, was violated. He took away everything. He took away all the shields of gold that Solomon had made. Remember those great big shields? He had so much gold, didn't know what to do with it. Hmm, well, we have some, uh, some uh, national ceremonies that we have. These shields would come in handy. They'd also be very good as, an, an, as a base for our economy. So, <coughs> make the golden shields. And so they're all put in, the, uh, in where they ought to be. <laughs> And uh, notice what happened. So he took everything, also took away all the shields of gold that Solomon had made. And King Rehoboam, uh, he must, maybe his relatives work for the treasury department today. What did he do? King Rehoboam made in their place shields of bronze. Shields of bronze. Idolatry turns gold into bronze. So, you fumble in your pocket, you pull out the $1 bill, click, click, click. How much is that worth? Oh, nothing! <laughs> because idolatry turns gold into bronze. We're on the air standard now, by the way. <coughs> so here's King Rehoboam. <coughs> and then he said, and he committed them to the hands of the officers of the guard who kept the door <coughs> of the king's house. Wow. He wants to keep up the process. He wants to keep up um, the whole process of, of religion here. He wants to keep it going. But um, there's no substance. He goes, all they're doing are handing, handling bronze shields right now. <clears throat> I often wondered, I've, given the, you know, the economic articles I read, I often wondered... Why do Brinks trucks have guards anymore? Why don't you just pull up and throw the bags in the sidewalk? <laughs> if you want to take them, take them. Well, well, it isn't worth much anyway. Just paper. And pretty soon, that'll blow away too. Unless there is repentance. So anyway, they were going through the rituals, no longer gold, just bronze. And as often as the king went into the house of the Lord, the guard carried them and brought them back to the guard room. Notice this. And then if you look down in verse 29, and the rest of the acts of Rehoboam and all they did, are they not written in the book of the Chronicles of the kings of Judah? And there was war between Rehoboam and Jeroboam continually, and Rehoboam slept with his fathers and was buried with his fathers in the city of David. His mother's name was Nema the Ammonite, and Abijam, his son, reigned in his place. Notice the phrase, and there was war between Rehoboam and Jeroboam continually. What happened to the peace? 
Where's the peace that Solomon was, 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 by which Solomon was blessed? Where is that? Well, that's gone. And uh, we don't have any more bronze shields. So all we have are, we don't have any more gold shields. They're all bronze now. And everything else is gone. So now they're on the bronze standard. <clears throat> What happens when the people of God embrace idolatry? People lose blessing. King of Egypt comes, robs them blind. Conflict continually. Where's the army? Not there. Because they're not trusting God. Idols bring conflict and peace goes away. It's just the way it is. Idolatry brings conflict and peace goes away. The blessings of God, his, his giving of prosperity is lost because idols turn gold into bronze. Notice Matthew 6, 19. If you look at Matthew 6, 19, I want to show you something here. Jesus speaking, Sermon on the Mount. Uh, <coughs> He's very clear on this. Jesus talking about fasting. He's after he's mentioned the Lord's Prayer. Then he says in verse 19, this is a command that he brings to the visible people of God. Do not lay up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal. All of that was gone. So what's Jesus saying? He goes on. But lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust destroys and where thieves break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. We are to bless the God of heaven and worship him, not the blessings that he gives us. We are to bless the God of heaven and to give him the glory, not the idols of the nations. They will come in and take over when we fail to worship God properly. The idols come in and the blessings go out. That's just the way it is. So then in time, all those who embrace idolatry will lose the blessing. So how might we apply this? How might we bring this into our modern era, into our modern lives. Consider this. In what areas of our lives right now have idols moved in? Now, we may be experiencing blessing at the moment. <clears throat> However, if this nation continues to print more money than the sand item, than, than the particles of sand on the sea, and there is nothing to undergird it, and continues to embrace its idolatry, the electronic numbers we have in our banks will be Zippo. So, um, what then shall we say? In, in our lives then, what is it that we want so much that we are willing to sin to get it? What is it that we want so much that we're willing to sin to get it? That's an idol. What is it that if we were to lose it, that we would blame God and be angry and blame all sorts of people around us? That's an idol too. So God wants us to worship him first and most. What are some of the idols among the people of God? The passion for these things can rise up so high they can eclipse God. Well, it's our... We want better and better. We want more and more. We want better relationships in terms of we just want to be liked, like, 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 like. That's the center of our life. We want bigger homes. We want bigger cars. We want better reputations. We want bigger jobs. We want more power. We want this. We want that. I want, I want, as Paul David Tripp would say. I want, I want, I want, I want, I want. But what about God? So. That which we want, and if, it, and if we don't get it, we're going to be angry. That's an idol. So 
God says, root them out. The blessings come from God. They don't come from idols and whatever we've received from God. If we idolize those things, we're going to lose them anyway. May our lives be rooted in God. Matthew chapter 6, if you're still in Matthew, take a look at verses 31 through the end of the chapter, all well, 233. Jesus says to his people, to the visible people of Israel in the day, Therefore, do not be anxious, saying, What shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or what shall we wear? Goodness. I have to admit, <clears throat> as I get older and I look at my one suit, I think I, I should get a better one. And then that thought goes away. Therefore, do not be anxious, saying, What shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or what shall we wear? Although I can tell you, I sure would like a really great one. I've seen some in the shops. <laughs> uh-uh, ain't happening. Um, Half-price shops, here I come. For the Gentiles seek after all these things, and your heavenly Father knows that you need them all. But, what does he say? Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added unto you. Wow. What is he saying? Our lives have to be rooted in God. Our lives have to be rooted in Christ. When they are, we know what the blessings are from God. When idols try to get in, they can't get into my life. I beat them back by the grace of God. So what happens when the people of God <clears throat> embrace idolatry? God is provoked and people lose blessing. And nations too. So then, here are some final thoughts. And we'll break early and have coffee and then go on in and hear the, the Butterfield testimony. Here's the good news. Perhaps as a believer you're saying, Oh, life is so hard. How can I possibly live with Christ on the throne of my life <clears throat> as, as an ongoing goal every day. How? Because the world is so strong, as Pastor Joel pointed out. That world just wants to pull us into its web every day. Oh, come, 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 come. You'll love this. And uh, when you come over there, you get your, you ever watch a little insect get stuck in a web? And you say, why are you watching webs? There's not much to do in Kwamba, let me tell you. Oh, there's a web. And when the bug gets stuck, can't get out. And then, mm, the spider is on top of the bug. Idols have webs and they bid us come. Oh, you won't get stuck. Come on over. And just, well, it's a little sticky. Grab a hold. It has you. So it's important. Here's the good news. God has given us the spirit as believers. Whereby we can put to death this passion for idols. Look at Romans 8.13. We talked about this yesterday at men's study. It's a great, uh, great passage. Romans chapter 8 verse 13. Because of the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Jesus Christ, here is the hope for all Christians. Romans 8, 13. For if you live according to the flesh, you will die, that is eternal death. But if you live by the Spirit, to all Christians, Paul is writing this. You put to death the deeds of the body, you will live. But if by the Spirit you put to death the deeds of the body, you will live. For all who are led by the Spirit of God are sons of God or daughters of God. Notice that. We can, by the power of the Holy Spirit, put to death passions for idols. Look at Colossians 3, 5, a little onward. Colossians chapter 3, Paul writing to the Colossian church. He says this, 
Put to death, therefore, what is earthly in you, sexual immorality, impurity, passion, evil desire, covetousness, what does he say, which is idolatry, and so on and so on and so on. And then down in verse 12 of Colossians 3, put on then as God's chosen ones, holy and beloved, compassion, kindness, humility, meekness, patience, etc. So we can, by the power of the Holy Spirit, put off the idol and put on that which pleases God. Believers can do that by the power of the Spirit. So we must decide to put to death our passion for idols, put to death those things that are idolatrous in our world by the power of God. Here's a great book. Brother Patrick recommended it. Great book. Page 81, Pursuit of Holiness, Jerry Bridges. I'm going to close with this, then we'll break. We need to brace ourselves up and to realize that we're responsible for our thoughts, attitudes, and actions. We need to reckon on the fact that we died to sin's reign. It no longer has any dominion over us that God has united us with the risen Christ in all his power and has given us the Holy Spirit to work in us. Critical point right here. Only as we accept our responsibility and appropriate God's provisions will we make any progress in our pursuit of holiness. That is to say, the rejection of idols. That is to say, the war against the flesh. Secondly, for Christians, listen to this. Pray for the nation. As Liz pointed out, pray for the nation. It's not Israel, but it's a nation like Israel. And it loves its idols. And it loves its perversions. And it hates God. Pray that the church, through the power of the Holy Spirit, might be revived. That there might be reformation and revival. And that this kind of church would influence America to go in another direction. Pray that the church remember... The judgment begins in the house of God. Let that spread out. And that our repentance would be real and our God would be exalted. If persecution is to come to this nation, I think it likely is. We already see signs of it. That's why we want to undergird our counseling center. We want to undergird it with God-centered, firm paperwork, if you like, so that when we're sued, we just bounce off for a season. And here's the last question. Have I repented and trusted in Jesus Christ? Perhaps the Holy Spirit is raising this up in the hearts and minds of some in our congregation even here today. Have I repented and trusted in Jesus Christ? Have I turned away from a life of self-indulgence and idolatry? And put my trust in Jesus Christ who suffered, died, and rose again, the Jesus of the Bible. This will make all the difference in one's life. Oh, the Christian life isn't easy, but it will make all the difference. And the Bible says, I'm just going to read this, because it's the person of the Holy Spirit at work through the Word of God who will do His mighty work. Listen to these, these verses. This is in the ESV. I memorized them in the King James but this is a delightful passage. Romans chapter 10, verse 8. But what does it say? The word is near you in your mouth and in your heart. That is the word of faith that we proclaim. Because if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord. And believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead. You will be saved. For with the heart one believes and is justified. And with the mouth one confesses and is saved. It is by the work of the Holy Spirit that one finds this great and delightful relationship with Jesus Christ. Therefore, 